Chapter 12. I stared straight ahead, trying to make sense of it. One of the humans I hadn't met yet scratched his head. I'm not the smartest guy around, he said, but that sounded a lot like a vote in support of the superiority. I recognized his voice from the radio. This was Netter, who flew with Arturo. They got to him somehow, I said. They must have threatened him. Bribery would never work on Rinnekin. He was too principled for that. But everyone had something they were afraid of. Everyone had something they weren't willing to sacrifice. I didn't know what that thing would be for me, and I hoped I never had to find out. My father would never capitulate to the superiority, Inan said. That's true, I said, mostly for the benefit of the humans. Because it was true, Rinnekin believed in debate, in discussion, in continuing to advocate and work with unity. He believed in persuading people to see reason, but he always stayed true to his principles. There was no way he'd flipped sides in a matter of hours. And even if he had, he would never have called me out like that. He sent me away. He told me to get help. He wouldn't do that and then announce to the entire planet that I was a fugitive. That was his voice, though, I said. They might have, they might have told him they'd captured his family, threatened to torture them. Gilliff squirmed, and I saw several of the other independence pilots looking at me in alarm. The idea that unity might torture someone seemed too violent, too aggressive, even for them. But given that Kill Quillen had just tried to kill me, I wasn't feeling so charitable. It's possible, Inan said. In that case, we need to rescue him. She looked at Jorgen. You saved us. Are you willing to help us with this as well? Rinnekin sent me to the humans to begin with, I told Inan. This alliance was his idea. This last operation hadn't gone as well as we would have liked, but we had more fighters now and there was still hope. We did come to help, Jorgen said, and I could practically hear him sorting his orders trying to figure out what he was authorized to do. It's obviously terrible that your leader is being used against your movement. But, Arturo said, we don't know that he has that he's been threatened, do we? How do we know that he hasn't changed his mind? Inan's eyes narrowed, but I spoke before she could. He hasn't. He wouldn't. Arturo and Jorgen exchanged a glance. These humans didn't know Rinnekin at all. They didn't know me well enough to trust my judgment on this, and they knew the rest of my people even less. In their position, I doubt me too. We need to think this through before we do anything, Arturo continued. Yeah, Netter said, we wouldn't want to defect on bad information or anything. We didn't defect, Jorgen said. We were ordered to go. We were specifically not ordered to go, FM said. Remember? Cobb phrased it that way because he had to, Jorgen said. They were still orders, even if they were not orders. That means it wasn't defection, right? He looked around at the others for confirmation. They all stared at him. Bless your stars, Kimlin said. Jorgen swore. The girl with the blue hair, sentry, I'd guessed based on the process of elimination, stepped up to me. We haven't met, she said. I'm Sadie, and that's Ned. Ned, at least that would be easy to remember. Sadie indicated the two men leaning against one of their ships, and that's Teestall and Catnip. Their real names are Trey and Corbin, but no one calls them that. They just go by their call signs. I had no idea which one was Teestall and which one was Catnip, but I didn't ask. This is my brother Gilliff, I said, and Rinnekin's daughter, Inan. I didn't know the names of everyone else, and no one seemed to feel that this was the time to require the humans to remember them all. I turned to Gilliff. I needed to convince the humans to mount an offensive against Unity from here, and that would be easier to do without the rest of my people standing here listening. We're going to need to map the facilities here, I said. Figure out what we're working with. Can you take the pilots and try to find somewhere safe for Rinnekin's family and others to rest? Gilliff glanced at Inan's pregnant belly, and Inan glared at him. She plainly disliked being treated like a baby simply because she was carrying one. I'm fine, Inan said, but it does seem wise to make sure we're safe here. Your captain is injured, and we and will need some place to rest. That was right. I stepped up to the exposed interior of the superiority ship. Several civilians sat inside, along with the independence captain, who lay on the floor with a medic attending to a wound in his leg. Does he need further aid? I asked. I could hyper-jump him to a hospital if it came to that, but, it was, but if it wasn't necessary, I didn't want to risk it. We can manage here, the medic said, though he'll need time before he can return to duty. All right, Gilliff said. He turned to Jorgen. Thank you for coming to our aid. Though that thing you did, moving us from place to place, are you all Cytonics? Jorgen looked alarmed, like he wasn't sure if he should give up their secrets. The humans had all left their slugs in their ships, and I didn't want to anger them. But knowing what assets we had on our side would only inspire my people. They have hyperdrives in their ships, I told Gilliff. Shake the branches, Gilliff said, and I heard more murmurs of shock and relief from the other pilots. 
We look forward to our alliance. He moved into the ship, helping the medic lift their captain, and together the group of pilots moved through the vestibule that led deeper into the platform. Inan and the other civilians followed them. I hoped the area wasn't too dangerous and that any scavengers were long gone, but Gilliff and the others had training. They could handle themselves and protect the others. I turned to Jorgen and the other humans. We'd come a long way, and I needed to convince them to stick with me a little longer. What do you need now? What do we need now? Jorgen asked. We don't know if your friend Rinnekin wants to be rescued. And these people, are they the only Erdile we can expect to be on our side? Rinnekin is on our side, I said. Yes, Jorgen said, but he's speaking publicly against you, and he's only one person. Lots of people would listen to Rinnekin, which made him one of one very important person, but given what we just heard, that worked against us at the moment. You're a fugitive, Jorgen said, and now we're fugitives for helping you. We're not going to escape court martial if we go home, Sadie said, are we? Jorgen might, Kimmelin said. Is your mom really going to put you in prison for defection? Maybe, Jorgen said, but it doesn't make me feel any better knowing they're willing to do that to the rest of you. Scud, what do we do? You could call Cobb, FM said. See what he wants us to do. Jorgen shook his head. Cobb said he'd be in touch, but I can't call him. He's trying to maintain the illusion that he had nothing to do with our departure, so my parents don't shut him out of the loop entirely. Can they do that? Kimlin asked. Maybe, Jorgen said. There aren't a lot of specific codes on the books for how intergalactic diplomacy should be handled, which gives them some leeway. Diplomacy is a mistake, I said. You're no better off there than you are here, not as long as your government is considering capitulation. If both our governments are moving in the same direction, what are we going to do about it? Jorgen asked. We're pilots. We don't have control over things like that. There are plenty of people on Redon who will do the right thing when they can see it clearly, I said. But they're being deceived. Unity talks like we can all get along, but we can't do that with people who want to oppress us. I looked around at the others, gauging their reactions. I was in a precarious position here. If they decided not to help me, the other pilots and I would be in it alone. The humans all looked at each other. They seemed resigned, which in this case was a good thing. I just needed to give them a reason to believe there was hope. Rescuing Rinnekin will make a difference, I said. He's beloved by many of my people. If Unity is threatening him and we get him to safety, then he can speak the truth. Tell people what Unity is really up to. They've taken over the military, captured our people, if people hear that news hear that news from Minikin's mouth, more of them will turn to our cause. Jorgen sighed. Okay, we're committed. Let's make the best of it. He looked up through the skylight at the giant auto turret, which had stopped firing. Through the negative realm, I could see Phil Quillen moving farther away. What exactly is this platform doing here? It was a battle platform, I said, abandoned after the Second War centuries ago. I think it used to move through the miasma at will, but now it simply drifts. We should take a look around, Jorgen said. The platforms on Detrius are similar, and they have all kinds of capabilities besides the auto-fire. Maybe it will have a shield we could get working or something else that might help us rescue Rinnekin. Jorgen turned to me. Is there a reason you don't hyper-jump in and pull him up here? Is it because you don't know where he is? If he keeps broadcasting, it will be easy enough to triangulate his location, I said. But some of the Unity Cytonics have the ability to inhibit, so they won't leave Rinnekin unguarded. The superiority also granted Unity some cytonic inhibitors, more than the ones in this ship. She, I gestured toward the wreckage. Is the inhibitor still on board? FM asked. It was a good question. The ship's inhibitor had, had stayed active, even after the cockpit was obliterated. It wasn't working now, but the technology should still be on board. I stepped in, into the empty hull, examining what was left of the ship. Rows of passenger seats were mostly still intact, and at the end of the aisle was a panel with instrumentation and a box set into the side of the ship. I moved up the aisle with FM right behind me. That's a Tanix box, FM said, and she squeezed past me and knelt down next to it. The other humans crowded around the hole in the hole, watching. There isn't a slug in it, Jorgen said. We'd be able to fill it if there were. He was right. The box felt empty to me. But when FM unlatched it and pulled it open, a pale blue Tanix with bright green spines stared up at us out of the box. Hey, baby, FM said, reaching in gently and pulling the slug out. She looked at Jorgen over her shoulder. No slug in the box, huh? I can't sense it in the negative realm, I said. I couldn't even t touch the area where it rested on FM's arms, though the area had been too small for me to notice before. It's inhibited itself. It's adorable, Sadie said. FM ran a hand down its spines, and it hummed quietly, as if nervous. I guess that answers the question about how they do it, Jorgen said. And now we have one. Maybe we could figure out how to use it to inhibit the platform. 
Can't you just ask it nicely, I asked. We can try, F.M. said, but it might need a little more instruction. Working with the others took time. Time, the truck trilled softly. Still, Jorgen said, if we can harness the platform's capabilities, we could buy ourselves some. That would also give us some time to determine Rinnekin's location. F.M. continued to hold the new slug, and she didn't seem eager to let it go. Technically, this slug should belong to my people, because it was recovered on our turf, but I didn't know what to do, to do with it. So for now, it was probably better off in her hands. I expect they'll be keeping Rinnekin on or near the Council Tree. That's where the Unity Cytonics live. More trees, Ned said. Do you really live on those, not down on the surface of the planet? Redon is a gas giant, I said. There is no surface except the core, and the atmosphere down there isn't re isn't breathable. You only go down there for my we only go down there for mining. This is your home planet, Sadie asked. Like your people lived in trees even before you had starfinders? Yes, I said. We've always made the trees of Redon our home. Sadie made a little squealing noise. That is so cool. And kind of terrifying, FM said. What if you fall? Do you often fall off your platforms? I asked. No, FM said, but we don't really live on those. It's a military base. The civilians on Detrius all live underground. There are no children on Platform Prime. We learn young how to be careful, I said. We don't walk on the edges of the branches without safety equipment. We have walls and railings and nets. A few people fall every year, but those deaths are mostly due to equipment failures, like having a cord break when rubber jumping. They all stared at me like I'd lost my mind. All right, Jorgen said. Let's do some poking around and see what we can find on this platform. I nodded. I wasn't sure what there would be to work with, but at least the humans weren't talking about fleeing anymore. Alani, Jorgen said, why don't you try the radio while we look around? See if you can find any more broadcasts that might give us a clue what the people who took Renekin are planning. The humans probably wanted to conference without me, but I couldn't stop them from talking to each other. Trying would make me look desperate. Okay, I said. FM carried the blue slug out of the ship, and the humans moved toward the doorway that led deeper into the platform. I, cl <clears throat> I climbed out of the superiority ship and moved to Jorgen's cockpit to fiddle with the radio. There was a box bolted beneath its dash, or his dash, similar to the one that had held the inhibitor slug. I popped the door open, and Boom Slug peered out at me experimentally, or expectantly, like I might provide more algae strips. He was about to be severely disappointed. The humans hadn't been gone for more than a few minutes when someone approached the open canopy. Arturo walked toward me with his yellow and blue slug and a sling across his chest. He must have come back to retrieve it from his ship. I moved to stand, but Arturo held up a hand. Alani, he said, can we talk? Yes, I said. Arturo looked over his shoulder like he was afraid we'd be overheard. The slug in the sling regarded me quizzically. I was thinking about what you said on Detrius about the superiority wanting you to turn over the humans you were working with. Well, I hadn't said that to him, so I guessed Jorgen must have told him. We weren't working with any humans, I said. Right, Arturo said, his face grim, but you are now. Oh, I'd been so focused on getting help that I hadn't thought of how that would look. Clearly, I shouldn't have told Jorgen about that particular demand. We were just fighting the people who want to turn you over to the superiority altogether, I said. Sure, Arturo said, but shooting at a few ships doesn't mean you aren't planning to betray us in some other way. That was true, and nothing I could say would prove otherwise. So you believe I'm lying to you? I don't know, Arturo said. I'm not sure what your motives are. Jorgen believes you do want to make an alliance with Detrius, that you're going to teach him how to use his powers. Use his powers, his Tanix added, as if for emphasis. Easy, Naga, Arturo said, petting its spines. I will, I said. I would be happy to, because we're working together. You all risked a lot to be here. We did, Arturo said, so I hope... You didn't come to Detrius looking for hu humans you could use to appease the superiority. I bristled. I would never work with them. Their wood is rotten all the way through. I want to believe you, Arturo said. So does Jorgen. That's why he didn't tell Cobb about what you said. He should have, obviously. Their commander had made a decision without all the information. Jorgen suspects me of deceiving you, I said. No, Arturo said. Jorgen is too busy worrying about whether he disobeyed orders. I'm worried you might be deceiving us. He looked me straight in the eyes. His were dark and deep, not clear and bright like most Erdile. Can we trust you? You already have. You did it when you left your planet with me. I'd fled when I'd first met them, not willing to offer them my trust, yet, yet they'd come to help me anyway. I wouldn't have done the same, but I was glad that in this way they weren't like me. 
We did, Arturo said, because the potential benefits outweigh the risks. We need allies, same as you, and we may be clueless when it comes to galactic politics, but we're not helpless. If you turn on us, we will fight back. You understand? Arturo presented the threat calmly and evenly, like it was nothing more than a fact. These humans possessed hyperdrives, had found the secret where I had failed. They'd also survived for nearly a century in the face of superiority, hostility. It would be a very serious mistake to underestimate you, I said. I'm glad we agree on that. And I have no intention of betraying you or your people. Arturo kept watching me, his face thoughtful, evaluating me. It bothered me that I couldn't read in his eyes what it was that he saw. Thank you, Arturo said. I hope we can keep this between us. And then he turned and walked confidently back in the direction of Jorgen and the others had gone. I watched until he was out of sight. I hadn't baited the humans here with the intention of trading them to the superiority, but I did want to use them, in a sense. Unity used the specter of human extinction to terrify me, my people into submission. If my people saw humans fighting on our side, they'd see that resistance was possible, even against terrifying odds. Their existence was a weapon I could use against my enemies. Given the circumstances, I would be foolish to, uh, to do otherwise.